Hello, Saints from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This is Micah from the two LDS archives. And today we have a paper, Where Are We? And as always, you can click on the, the link provided in the description box of every video. And it'll take you over to my family's website in which you can find a copy of what you're seeing here provided for free in Word or PDF. You don't have to sign up for anything or even give me your email. You just have to click it and download it. We are also providing what you're hearing in an audio file. So if the uh, audio file on YouTube is too loud or too soft, uh, you can download it and do what you want with it. Some people have suggested turning it into a podca podcast. You can do that if you'd like. So you can take the audio file and do whatever you like with it. I don't make any money from this, so I would just uh, pray that uh, you don't attempt to take um, anything related to the Word of God and attempt to make a living off of it, uh, to, to sell it. So uh, other than that, you can head on over there and you can pick up these items totally for free, ad-free over on the family website. Today we have a very long paper that is almost entirely points of reference based. Now if you don't know what a point of reference is, you don't even know what that means, I would suggest stopping this video, going on over and watching my points of reference video um, or reading that paper to understand what that concept means. That is what we're going to be going over in this paper. A heavy in-depth breakdown of points of reference uh, specifically um, where we are at today in the macro last day timeline um, in respect to what president nelson and others identified at conference and in their talks uh, and in their footnotes of their talks etc so the macro last day timeline is doctrine the points of reference uh, points of references or points of reference are real the dates attached to them or attaching specific events to specific points of reference, etc. That was speculation, right? So if you want, wanted to say, hey, you know, I think 2020, the hinge point, I think that was going to be the desolating sickness, okay? That was me speculating. Uh, me saying, hey, I think COVID is the desolating sickness. That's speculation, right? Well, maybe not any longer. There has been a lot of talk and a lot of buzz about what our prophet, uh, President Nelson, identified in this last conference. I will get into that personally when we break uh, break down those talks um, or that talk specifically. In the meantime, however, let's figure out or get a reference, a refresher on the verses and the verses that surround them that President Nelson and others identified in his or their April 2021 talks. So what, I, what I'm saying here is let's go to these points of reference. Let's go to these verses specifically and the verses surrounding them to get an understanding of the points of reference breakdown and understanding of timeline of it. That way, when um, we go back and, uh, and listen to these talks, we will understand what's going on, right? Understanding the points of references. Understanding the macro last day timeline will then enable us as saints of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to clearly understand A, the time period we are in, and B, what President Nelson and others actually identify. If you don't understand the macro last day timeline, if you don't understand those verses of Scripture uh, specifically and the ones surrounding them, when they quote them and say this is happening today, uh, and they do that in general conference, uh, it'll just go over your head. You won't know what they're actually saying. Um, so it's important to do that. So in this paper, we're going to be going to a, through a breakdown verse by verse of all of these locations. It's going to be heavy, heavy, heavy macro last day timeline points of reference. So if this is something you're not interested in, uh, I would you know obviously suggest bailing now. But if, you, if you're curious and you want to know, well, where are we? I get it. We're in the last days. I get it. We're in the last dispensation. I get it, right? I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That's part of – that's by joining the church, we accept that by virtue of the Book of Mormon and what it entails, which is the last dispensation, which is the, the, the wrapping up scene. We all get that. But where are we? Where are we in the prophetic scene of, uh, scene of things? Well, we're going to break that down today. So if you're really curious about that, uh, and, and getting a breakdown of that based purely on the scriptures, not off of uh, Micah's speculation or on the philosophies or opines of men, but actually what the scriptures teach us. Then continue on, it, uh, and we will uh, be doing that in this in this uh, paper or video um, or audio file if you're listening to it. So we're going to start in Doctrine 45. 
that's the big one that um, that was hit a lot at this conference, specifically uh, verses 23 through 33, but we're going to be breaking them down and, and, and chewing this up piece by piece. So um, we're going to start in the first two verses, 23 and 24. And in this ye say truly, for so it is. But these things which I have told you shall not pass away until all shall be fulfilled. This is Jesus speaking on the Mount of Olives. And this I have told you concerning Jerusalem. And when that day shall come, shall a remnant be scattered among all nations. Okay. Now, now, now just you know, the literal plain language of this, we should know what this is talking about, right? He's not saying that a, a, a remnant of the Jews in Jerusalem after the first abomination of desolation are going to join all the different faiths in the world. He's not talking about a spiritual scatter, scattering among all the nations. No, this is a literal thing. Okay, This remnant is referring to the Jews who were scattered among all nations physically after the first abomination of desolation. Jesus clearly stated here that they will remain, those, those individuals, those uh, of the tribe of Judah that were scattered physically among all, all, all the people of the earth, they will remain that way, scattered physically. This is not spiritually, okay? Because they didn't join all these other different faces, faiths. That's not what he's talking about here. They'll be scattered among all these nations until the times the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now, a lot of people, including myself, will use um, Elder Pratt's quote regarding the times the Gentiles ending when the Jews return again there physically to prove that the times of Gentiles ended, obviously. And we, I will use other quotes uh, as well, such as the one from President Joseph F. Smith that said the same thing when it was taking place. But they, or me, we don't have to. Jesus said the exact same thing here in clear, plain language. Reading it in this context provided by the Savior, it is clear that it is talking about a physical separation, a physical scat scattering, and thus a physical gathering. You can't take what the Savior said here and say, well, the first half of what he prophesied was fulfilled when the Jews were physically scattered from Jerusalem, and then turn around and make the second half of it spiritual, i.e. a spiritual gathering. For the language doesn't change. It's one fluid sentence, one fluid thought process that they will be gathered they'll be kicked out of jerusalem and they'll be scattered everywhere throughout the world until the times of the gentiles be fulfilled and then they will be gathered again unto this place okay very 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 clear okay verse 25 but they shall be gathered again but they shall remain until the times of the gentiles be fulfilled so they will be gathered again a spiritual gathering no come on people no it's a physical gathering because the first half of it was a physical separated. But they will be gathered again. Don't you worry. I get it. They're going to be kicked out of Jerusalem. I get it. Then they're going to remain out of Jerusalem, scattered, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And in that day, okay, what day? In the days of the generation in which the times of the Gentiles were fulfilled, i.e., in the lifespan of or in the lifetime of that generation. And I should also mention at this time that I forgot, uh, if you're new to the channel or you're new to my, my work, anything that I write in black is a, a, a direct quote from a scripture or some other individual. If it's, a, if it's in purple, that's a direct quote from an LDS student manual. And if it's blue, these are my words, okay? So going back to Doctrine and Governments 45, it continues, Shall be heard of wars and rumors of wars, and the whole earth shall be in commotion, and men's hearts shall fail them. And they shall say that Christ delayeth his coming until the end of the earth. And the love of man shall wax cold, and iniquity shall abound. Okay, well, in those verses we begin to see these prophecies clearly being fulfilled from 1917 to 1967. Okay, and that's the time period of when the Times of Gentiles was fulfilled. You want more breaks down of that. There's lots of papers on that uh, everywhere on the time period of when they began to be gathered back physically to Jerusalem. Uh, Joseph F. Smith identifying and saying this is the sign for the Times of the Gentiles ending and identifying of that generation. 
Um, but many of these things do not, these things that Jesus prophesied would happen here, they do not find their fulfillment actually during the years of 1917 to 1967, right? We need to understand that because what we need to understand is that what, that, what that's doing in 1917, 1967 is identifying the generation. So rather what we're learning is that these things will be fulfilled during the lifetime of that generation in which the times of the Gentiles is fulfilled. Now, we will get to that to that understanding and, and, and explaining of that a lot clearer by the time we get um, oh, by the time we get to the desolating sickness and, and, and that verse. But we'll also get to explaining um, uh, the love of men waxing cold. But once again, by the time we hit verse 33 um, down below. So we're going to continue when the times of the Gentiles is come in. Once again, right, very unique language here. We have to understand that this is a identifying of a generation. This is identifying of entering a time period and then what that generation will see in its lifetime. Okay, so we need to understand these different phases and what the Lord is talking about specifically. We have to talk about here is come in. What does that mean? We have to understand that this is extremely unique grammar and that could confuse some people. So we, we have to, once again, we have to ask questions here. Just like we do with all points of reference. So what's the, what's the question we need to ask here? Come in. Well, come into what? What is this talking about? Well, the Lord just described the times of the Gentiles being fulfilled. And then he says this. And when the times of the Gentiles is come in. Once again, when the times of the Gentiles has come into what time period? Well, what, what's the, what, does that, what, what would be the nat natural conclusion uh, from, uh, that we can glean off of that? Well, it's the time period of its ending. We, in hindsight, know that this occurred between 1917 to 1967, but let's look at this and let's see if it holds true, okay? When the times of the Gentiles is come into the period of its ending and the identifying of the generation in which the time of Gentiles is ended, 1917 to 1967, a light shall break forth among them that sit in darkness, and it shall be the fullness of my gospel. Okay, well, we know that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints went global during this exact time period. And more specifically, in this generation, it was made a reality. This was the generation that went off as missionaries and went off the world in the process of making it global, okay? And because in that generation, right, meaning in the lifespan of that generation, all of these things would eventually be fulfilled. The generation in which the times of the Gentiles was identified, we can see and recognize that that time period, but we should also know that the complete fulfillment of everything listed was not to take place entirely from 1917 to 1967, but during the lifetime of that generation. Now this will become crystal clear by the time we hit verse 31. Okay, in verse 29 we read, but they receive it not for they perceive not the light, and they turn their hearts uh, from me because of the precepts of men. Now, in this paper, I have highlighted some things in highlighter so that you can see correlations and word associations as we go on. So that way you can know how we're making these points of references and connecting them because it's talking about the same thing. So in this case, we're going to highlight that in gold. Okay, we need to understand now that this point of reference, right, when they turn their hearts from me because of the precepts of men, that this could occur no sooner then 1917 to 1967, based off of the points of reference we just hit above. Meaning, this verse 29 did not occur during the life of Joseph Smith. This will become even clearer with the study of 2 Nephi 27 and an understanding of the points of reference tied to verse 25 of that chapter. In that generation shall the times of the, shall the, times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Okay, 1917 to 1967 is that generation, uh, anyone born in that time period. And there shall be men standing in that generation. Okay, now once again, now here we go. Like, did, was all, were all of them supposed to be fulfilled from 1917 to 1967? Well, no, because this verse right here in 31 says, and there shall be men standing in that generation that shall not pass, meaning they won't die, until they see an overflowing scourge because a desolating sickness shall cover the land. 
So let's uh, get into this. There will be men standing born in that generation from 1917 to 1967, right? They'll be born in that time period that will not die until they see a desolating sickness that will pave way for an overflowing scourge. There are those that don't understand that the desolating sickness is not the same thing as pestilence, plague, and the plague. Once again, there are many earthquakes mentioned uh, in last day's timelines uh, and uh, prophecies, but there is only one, the earthquake, that will unite the continents once again. That's the earthquake that takes place after the Mount of Olives. Similarly, this desolating sickness will make things desolate, um, and uh, we learn um, from the, def des uh, the definition of desolate, um, which I've had this sent to me actually by a couple people to, to, to point me to this, and uh, we actually talked about this on multiple firesides. This is a great way. I'm glad people are picking up on this because this is something that we've been we've been talking about for a long time. Like I, I've mentioned this in videos. Blake's uh, from Defending Zion has mentioned this uh, a lot, um, and we've mentioned this a lot in firesides. I'm glad people are finally starting to pick up on this. Okay, so uh, just understanding the definition of the word desolate uh, would help us to understand this. Now you can go back to the old definitions, or you can go, go that were you know in the, the 1980s or whatever. You can look at ones today. But there really isn't that much difference. So this one actually is uh, the newer one. That it says here, devoid of inhabitants and, and visitors. Like it, it looks deserted or is deserted. A desolate, abandoned town. Uh, joyless. Um, disconsolate and sorrowful uh, through. Um, or as if through separation from a loved one. A desolate widow. Now I should ring some bells because once again, this is going back to uh, Isaiah's imagery. I'm um, showing the effects of abandonment and neglect, dilapidated, a desolate old house, barren, lifeless, desolate landscape, devoid of warmth, comfort, or hope, gloomy, desolate memories. Verb, to deprive of inhabitants, the neighbors down were desolate, to lay waste, uh, to forsake, to make wretched. Like these are all different definitions. Um, that we can get back to here to understand what's actually being what 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 is the desolating sickness well the desolating sickness is not the various plagues and pestilences that are to be poured out in the last days now for a further breakdown of that you can see my last day macro my last my macro last day timeline series that you can figure out when those things actually begin to take place the lord in the next verses describes the effects of the desolating sickness and the scourge and the conditions in the world at that time. This helps us not only understand the time period, but also helps us identify the desolating sickness and the scourge or scourging. Another thing that we can take from this is that the sickness would come near the end of that generation's lifespan. For if it happened earlier in their lifespan, the Lord would have said, ah, it'll come quickly. This will come quickly for this generation, or it will speedily be upon this generation. But he didn't. You know, opposed to that, the Lord actually said, not all of this generation will have died out before this hits. Ergo, this desolating sickness was to come probably within the last 20 years of this generation's life expectancy. This would have allowed saints in 1965 and 19, to 1985 to know that the desolating sickness probably wasn't going to be around for a while. Okay? So uh, going back to Doctrine and Covenants 45, read, but my disciples who stand in holy places, it shall not be moved, but among the wicked men shall lift up their voices and curse God and die. And uh, this is interesting because President Nelson told us to um, search out all the promises made to the house of Israel. And, um, and then in this last conference, he talked about continuing to stand in holy places. And uh, we, we learn in Dr. Covenant 45, the student manual, we, there's a quote there provided by President Harold B. Lee in which he says that you want to know where the, the, these places of safety are. Look up the, the, the promises made to the house of Israel is basically what he said. Look up the, the commandments of the Lord and the promises attached to them. And when you do that, you'll get a good idea of – you'll get a good idea of what these are. You get a good idea of what those are. So um, I believe President Nelson did identify that. Many. So he said, uh, if you had been studying the, the scriptures, and like if you had studied these things, uh, you would know uh, these things. And then he got a little bit frustrated and said that if you don't know these things, um, 
uh, if you don't know these holy places, it's because uh, you're uh, participating, participating in lazy scripture study. So um, this can be interpreted as both spiritual death and physical death. And we can do this because the Lord identifies the first group. Okay, so this here, it says, um, my disciples shall stand in holy places and shall not be moved, but among the wicked, um, men shall lift up their voices and curse God and die. Okay, so that's the contrast here. There's two different groups. Okay, now this can be interpreted as both physical and spirit, uh, uh, physical death. Um, but which one is more correct? Okay, we can do this because, so why can we identify some things as physical sa separations and not uh, spiritual separations and vice versa, right? Why can we do that? And um, in this case, we can do this because the Lord identifies the first group as standing in holy places and being not moved. Yes, that absolutely could mean a physical location, but we need to understand the physical locations hold no spiritual power or become holy. They don't, none of that without spiritual power and or keys, right? Or in other words, they do not become holy without spiritual power, right? Holy, so holy places do not become holy without holy people, right? Uh, uh, the temples are uh, more holiness to the Lord, houses of holiness, so they're only holy. Why? Because they are places that the risen Lord can go to and is. They're not holy until that happens. They're not holy until the key is set it apart for such a purpose. It's just a building, right? So holy people make places holy. Unhol uh, uh, holy places don't make holy people. As President Nelson and many prophets have said, it's easier to build a temple than it is to build a temple-ready people. Right? We need to we need to understand that, right? There are no holy places without holy people. Ergo, to be not moved in a holy place is to hold to one's faith and spiritual power and worthiness to stand in those places. Now, this could be your house, for example, but it won't be holy if you are not holy, right? The same is said of temples. As soon as something or someone unholy enters into the temple it is no longer holy until that which is unholy has left the premise okay with that understanding the second half of this would make more sense because the second half says that uh, people are going to be uh, the wicked will be lifting up their their voices and cursing god and dying well yes this absolutely could refer to physical death but let's think about this a second but it can't entirely refer to physical death right that separation because to, to make that separation would be to imply that the righteous are standing in holy places and somehow don't die physically, and the, the wicked are cursing God dying. Meaning, meaning to, to hold that belief as entirely physical would be to purport that the righteous won't suffer from physical death while only the wicked will suffer from physical death. Now, that's not true. Joseph Smith taught us that both the righteous and the wicked in the last days will be subject to weaknesses of the flesh. Right, and will succumb to plagues, pestilence, and, and sicknesses, and they shall die physically. Meaning, just because somebody dies, that does not mean they were wicked. Yet, these people were cursing God and dying, and that's the separation we're given here. And in the first case, there was no mention of death, so it just said they were standing in holy places and were not moved. Meaning, this has to be referring to spiritual death. And I would ask, has not COVID done this? Has it not woken people up on one hand or the other? Now let's think about this. What did what did President Nelson say? President Nelson said that 2020 would be a hinge point. A hinge point for what? A hinge point to decide between whether or not we were going to stand in holy places and be not moved or curse God and die. That's a hinge point. And has this COVID, has not 2020 done this has it not exacerbated this has it not woken people up as i've said to a higher standard of gospel learning has it not done that for for a large large group of people woken them up right and then caused them to stand in holy places they wanted to make themselves more worthy they wanted to know what's going on and they began to stand more in holy places they they began to sure up their testimonies but on the on the contrary haven't we seen likewise on the other side have we not seen droves of people die spiritually? Like droves of people die spiritually within the last year or two. Have we not seen droves of people 
give into itching ears and and uh, stand in unholy places? Did not our prophet say uh, this in the last conference? Did he not identify and say that if you surround yourself with people who will destroy your faith, you will die spiritually. Yea, you shall curse God and die. Did he not likewise say that the righteous will continue to stand in holy places? And note, temples are still shut down. Meaning, according to the prophet and his understanding, this deals almost entirely with one's worthiness, not a location. President Nelson is clearly identifying the macro time period we are in as this period. The Lord continues to explain the condition of the world during the desolate sickness. And there shall be earthquakes also in diverse uh, diverse places. Also, it's one of those points of reference key indicators that we need to pay attention to. It means in addition to. In this case, in addition to what? In addition, in addition to the desolate sickness and the signs and symptoms of it. Well, did we not experience at this time, at this exact time, an earthquake in Utah, Idaho, Alaska, etc., one of which even caused uh, Moroni to drop his trumpet at the Salt Lake City Temple? Is this not so far exactly what happened? Okay, let's continue. And many desolations. Okay, well, if this was the plague, now when people refer to the, the plague, with their eyes and you know popping out of their head and all those nasties, they're referring to the uh, trumpets, right? And these are the trumpets that that start going off after the seven seals open. Now, if it's refer, if it, this is, is referring to that, there wouldn't be many desolations. There would only be one, and that would be a horrendous and horrific death. These this desolating sickness, however, it says will cause many desolations. Can we not see all of them? Our church is empty, depression on the rise, obesity on the rise, loneliness, streets, empty, etc. It's staggering and overwhelming the amount of examples that we can point to to describe these many desolations. The Lord goes into the next, uh, uh, into next another thing that has been made desolate, the courage of men, men's hearts failing them. And in what or how do men's hearts fail them? Only when they fail to let God prevail. And the act of not letting God prevail is an act of pride that is described thus. Yet men will harden their hearts against me. This is the antithesis, antithesis of letting God prevail. We prevail with God when we build upon him and his rock. When we harden our hearts against him, it is when we choose our own way versus the Lord's way. This is the point of reference that we we are in right now. A test, a test, a test. Will you let God prevail? Will you give the Lord your heart of stone so that he may place in you a heart of flesh? That's found in Ezekiel 36, 26. 36, 26, and we should pay attention to that process because once again, that chapter comes right before Ezekiel 37. So once again, same types and shadows of how this is going to play out in our day. Or will you harden your hearts? Did we go to the source, right? Did we go to the Prophet Joseph Smith? Did we go to the Book of Mormon, etc.? Or did we go to the philosophies and uh, sophistries and opinions of men? Did we decide to develop faith as the brother of Jared? Or did we decide to shorten the arm of the Lord and spiritualize and make figurative his word? That is where we are now. If you have shortened the arm of the Lord and attempted to make figurative his word, well, President Nelson taught... That the only reason why you could do this, or you would do that, is because you are pra uh, participating in lazy scripture study. And you might think that is harsh now, right? Just like those who thought their drill sergeant was harsh now. But there will come a day where if you listened and heeded, despite being upset, well, there will come a day that that frustration and possibly even hatred towards those individuals that were pushing you. It will be replaced with gratitude and love. This is also where verse 27 comes back in our timeline. The love of men shall wax cold and iniquity shall abound. That's from earlier in Doctrine and Covenants uh, 45. Well, let's turn to the Doctrine and Covenants student manual and let's learn something here. In Doctrine and Covenants 45, 
27 student manual, it asks the question, what will cause the love of men to wax cold? Now, this is great. The expression is the same as found in Matthew 24. Now, once again, um, Joseph Smith Matthew is another solid tie-in for this exact same point of reference chain, where we read, translated literally, and because lawlessness has abounded, the love of many, and this include or this indicates more than few, shall wax cold. Love here means Christian unity and harmony. End quote from the LDS student manual. So we learn here that what is causing the love of man to wax cold is the molestation of the law. Do we know anything dealing with the Assyrian or scourge or maybe even what's going on right now with COVID and the destroying of the laws of the land? Uh, yes. Understanding Isaiah chapter 10, the parable of the nobleman and the olive trees, etc., all teach us this. The Assyrian or scourge will be destroying the laws of the land. Third Nephi 24, we read, Ye have said it is vain to serve God. What does it profit that we have kept his ordinances and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the proud happy. Yea, they that work wickedness are e even set up. Yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. End quote. In these scriptures, we learn of the same points of reference. The Assyrian or scourge will be molesting the laws of the land, which is causing the love of man to wax cold. Yea, they are cursing God and dying, while the righteous are standing in holy places. And here it is better explained as pockets of saints preaching the word of God and teaching to fear the Lord according to the Lord's precepts, not man's. The Lord then describes in verse 16 and 17 that this is a large part of the test or requirement for the new Jerusalem. Verse 18, we have the return of Joseph Smith, who then judges, once again, the same points of reference. Okay, so what comes next in Doctrine and Covenants 45? And they will take up the sword one against another, and they will kill one another. Okay, wicked men using false doctrines can kill you with their sword, spiritually speaking. But can the righteous? Can the righteous using the sword of truth, i.e. the scriptures, kill people? No, right? They don't kill others. Meaning this reference has to refer to literal bloodshed, literal civil war. That is what is on our horizon, what is in our near future. And we just learned what will be the cause of this. The Assyrian molests the laws of the land. The love of men then waxes cold, and then men start killing each other. This time period is described again later in Doctrine and Covenants 45, but now that we have correctly inserted 30 by 24, our understanding of Joseph Smith's return, the redemption of Zion, and the initial building of New Jerusalem, we now know occurs before the war gets poured out. The Lord here is warning that during this time period, this is your last time to flee to New Jerusalem. For those that will not flee at that time must needs take up the sword against their neighbor. So let's read those up and finish that off in Doctrine and Covenants 45, verses 63 through 69. Ye hear of wars in foreign lands, but behold, I say unto you, they are nigh, even at your doors. And not many days hence ye shall hear of wars in your lands. Wherefore I, the Lord, have said, Gather ye out from the eastern lands, assemble ye, ye yourselves together, ye elders of my church, go ye forth, into the western countries, call upon the inhabitants to repent, and in as much as they do not, or as much as they do repent, build up churches unto me, and with one heart and with one mind gather up your riches, that ye may purchase an inheritance which shall hereafter be appointed unto you. And it shall be called the New Jerusalem, a land of peace, a city of refuge, a place of safety for the saints of the Most High God. And the glory of the Lord shall be there, and the terror of the Lord shall also be there, insomuch that the wicked 
will not come up unto it, and it shall be called Zion. So once again, the glory of the Lord shall be there, the terror of the Lord, and the wicked won't come up to it. So um, once again, this can't be referring to Salt Lake City because there is plenty of wicked. And it shall come to pass among the wicked that every man that will not take up the sword against his neighbor must needs flee unto Zion for safety. And there shall be gathered unto it out of every nation under heaven, and it shall be the only people that shall not be at war one with another. Okay, well, let's read more points of reference dealing with this war. Okay, so let's go to Dr. Covenant 87, and that'll give us some more. But let's start at the beginning so we can have a buildup because a lot of people are really confused about this chapter. So let's just tear through this chapter real quick. Verily thus saith the Lord concerning the wars that will shortly come to pass, beginning at the rebellion of South Carolina, which will eventually terminate in the death and misery of many souls. And the time will come that that war will be poured out upon all nations, beginning at this place. For behold, the southern states shall be divided against the northern states. So one, we have the American Civil War. That's what that's talking about. Continuing, and the southern states will call upon other nations, even the nation of Great Britain, as it is called. Okay, so point two, the South will ask Great Britain for aid during the American Civil War. Okay, continuing. And Great Britain shall also call upon other nations in order to defend themselves against other nations. And then war shall be poured out upon all other nations. Okay, uh, that's World War Point Three. That's World War One and World War Two. Okay, continuing. And it shall come to pass after many days. Okay, so point four is we now have many years after World War II. So we're now saying many years after World War II. Okay, what do we have? We have slaves shall rise up against their masters who shall be marshaled and disciplined for war. Okay, so what do we get during that's happening uh, during, those, uh, during those many years? And then after those many years, we have five Masters are becoming marshaled and disciplined for war. That's your Assyrian and scourge. Six, the slaves rise up against them. Well, why are they slaves? Because the laws have been molested. Then we continue, and it shall come to pass also. Okay, so once again, in addition to. When it says also, it means in addition to. But we need to know in addition to what. Okay, it says in addition to. So to what we just said. And what did we just say? So in addition to slaves fighting against masters. That the remnants who are left of the land will marshal themselves. And shall become exceedingly angry. And shall vex the Gentiles with a sore vexation. That's point seven. This is Joseph's boys. This is after 30 by 24. Um, and after the open return of Joseph Smith. Uh, I'll go over this more when we break down 30 by 21 below. Continuing in Dog and 87, and thus with the sword and by bloodshed, the inhabitants of the earth shall mourn. This is eight. This is the neighbor taking up sword against neighbor. This is the whole earth in commotion, etc. This is what we just went in, uh, what we just read in Dog and 45. Continuing, and with famine and plague and earthquake and the thunder of heaven and the fierce and vivid lightning also shall the inhabitants of the earth be made to feel the wrath and indignation and chastening hand of the Almighty God. So nine, this is everything highlighted in green. So if you're going to go uh, read the um, half an hour of silence or the understanding of revelation, that's everything highlighted in green. This is the period between the redemption of Zion and the anointing or opening of the seventh seal. This is Doctrine and Covenants 88, verses 85 through 92. This is uh, the teachings of the prophet. Joseph Smith, page 17. So let's read that, Teachings of the Prophet, page 17. Quote, And now I am prepared to say by the authority of Jesus Christ that not many years shall pass away before the United States shall present such a scene of bloodshed as has not parallel in the history of our nation. Semicolon. People will say that this is the talking about the American Civil War. It's not. Because of what he attaches to it as an asterisk, he says, pestilence, hail, famine, and earthquake will sweep the wicked of this generation from off the face of the land. Okay, So he says that will happen in conjunction with that war. And that will open and prepare the way for the return of the lost ten tribes from the north country. Okay, So those things have to happen before the ten tribes return. 
The people of the Lord, those who have complied with the requirements of the new covenant, have already commenced to gather together uh, to Zion, which is in the state of Missouri. Okay, so for those who purport that Salt Lake City is the New Jerusalem, we got a couple of problems here. One, he says that Zion, the New Jerusalem, will be in the state of Missouri. That, that That's where this is taking place. But then he also says that um, that he also says that they're gonna the ten tribes will return after these events, the pestle and hail and stuff. So for those who report that Salt Lake City is the New Jerusalem, and here's another one that the ten tribes have already returned before any of these events have happened, they are calling the Lord and Joseph Smith liars. Unless there has already been pestilence, hail, famine, etc., post Joseph Smith saying this quote, that have wiped the wicked of this generation off of the face of the land that I wasn't aware of. You would also then have to then say that the 10, that if you're saying the 10 tribes uh, will return as a body, you're saying that that is the baptizing of them. Then you're also saying that there was nobody standing next to Joseph that had a patriarchal blessing already given to them. That was of a different tribe, which is not true. There were actually people identified by patriarchal blessings from multiple tribes when Joseph Smith gave this. So he knew about the gathering of scattered Israel versus the return of them as a body. He said that the return of them as a body will not occur until after that event. I know that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God, and I know that Jesus Christ is not a liar. Yea, I know that the heavens and the earth will pass away, but the Lord's words shall never pass away. Because I know that, because of that, I know, and so would you if you held the testimony, that the redemption of Zion and a Zion people complying with the laws are prerequisite for these events, as made clear by Joseph Smith in this quote above. Meaning that it has to have taken place before these events described here by Joseph Smith, as well as in verse 6. Meaning, we know that the redemption of Zion has to take place no later than verse 4 and 5 in Doctrine and Covenants 87. With President Nelson in this conference, this is April 2020, or 2021, clearly identifying the points of reference that we are currently in. Once again, we're out of time. We're out of town. We're out of time. If COVID is the desolating sickness, which President Nelson um, uh, uh, himself identifies that it is in his references and what he said so that's his belief COVID is the desolating sickness and those events have just taken place we know what comes next it is the last line that we went over in doctrine and covenants 45 33 it is verses 4 and 5 here so let's continue uh continue reading in doctrine and covenants 87 6 till the consummation decree is made a full end of all nations that the cry of the saints and the blood of the saints shall cease to come up under the ears of the lord of the Lord of Sabbath, from the earth to be avenged of their enemies. We will get into verse 7 later when we go through 3rd Nephi and Revelation chapter 6, verse 10. The color coordination once again is provided here for you to compare for when we get down below to get those references so you can understand how much these are direct um, relations to each other. This destruction will grow exponentially from the anointing until the great and dreadful day. This generally describes the events from the anointing to the great and dreadful day. Finishing up that chapter, the Lord says, Wherefore, stand ye in holy places, and be not moved until the day of the Lord come. For behold, it cometh quickly. Saith the Lord, Amen. Now, it's fascinating to note, or at least it should be, that the Lord gives an extremely macro timeline from the time of Joseph, or that's what's being given here, um, from the time of Joseph to the great and dreadful day. And after giving that macro timeline, we then, or he then, hones in on one single point of reference, and only one point of reference, and it was, once again, as it always is, the time period directly before the redemption and building of New Jerusalem, and the Lord coming to it, i.e., the verse that we just went over in Doctrine Covenants 45.32. Okay, stand ye in holy places. It should be flabbergasting. It should be mind-blowing. It should be life-altering. For saints of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to realize that A, this is the most talked about and prophesied time period in the history of the world 
save the life of Jesus Christ alone. I.e. the ten virgins, i.e. Doctrine Numbers 45, the parable of the nobleman, the olive trees, etc. B. The prophet of God, President Nelson just identified in April 2021 that today is that time period. And C. You reading this? You hearing this? You comprehending it? You are living in that time period. It is right now. In 2014, President Nelson said, 2014, President Monson said, time to repair is now. 2019, President Nelson said that time to repair is running out. President Nelson later in 2020 prophesied, we have front row seats to witness live what the prophet Nephi saw only in vision. And now, in 2021, President Nelson confirms we are in fact, smack dab right in the middle of this time period that he said we would be. The stakes have never been higher. The reward never so great. The consequences never so dire. Let's now get into 2 Nephi 27, which President Nelson also identified at this conference, specifically 2 Nephi 27, 19 through 26. Those are the verses that we're going to be going over. Now, I did a complete breakdown of the entirety of 2 Nephi chapter 27, in Joseph Smith's return continued. But for this, let's just hone in on specifically the verses in question here, which also tie directly into Dr. Covenants 45 and everything we have done so far. I.e., let's start with 2 Nephi 27 25, or, or i.e., the comparisons between I i.e. the comparison between 2 Nephi 27 25 with Doctrine and Covenants 45 29. Right? So that's an example of what we're going to be doing here, how these tie together. People need to understand these points of reference. Okay, they need to understand them. Point of reference number one, Joseph Smith is called of the Lord. Okay, Joseph Smith history, we read, my object in going to acquire the Lord was to know which of all the sects was right, that I might know which to join. No sooner, therefore, did I gain possession of myself so as to be able to speak. Then I asked the personages who stood above me in the light which of all the sects was right, for at this time it had not entered into my heart that all were wrong, and which I should join. I was answered that I must join none of them, for they were all wrong, and the personage who addressed me, said that all their creeds were an abomination in sight, and those professors were all corrupt, and they draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They teach for doctrines the commandments of men, having a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. Many in the church are familiar with this point of reference, but they get it confused with verse 25 in 2 Nephi 27, which we'll be going over in a sec. And, but we need to understand that A, the correct placement in terms of the points of reference of um, Joseph Smith praying in the grove versus 2 Nephi 27-25. And B, we need to understand the differences then between them. We need to understand the differences between Joseph Smith history 18 and 19 and 2 Nephi 27 verses 24 and 25, which we'll get to. Okay, the second point of reference, point of reference number two, Joseph Smith translates the Book of Mormon but does not translate the sealed portion uh, and then he returns the plates. This takes place between 2 Nephi 27, verses 9 through 20. Now, verse 15 deals with the process described in verse 9. This is Joseph Smith delivering the manuscript to Martin Harris, who then delivered it to the learned, etc., etc. This process goes from verse 15 to verse 20 in 2 Nephi chapter 27, and it's described well in the Old Testament student manual for Isaiah uh, chapter 29, uh, 11 through 12, uh, which reads Isaiah 29, 11 through 12, what was the book? that is sealed, and to whom were its words delivered. Early in the process of translating the Book of Mormon, Martin Harris desired proof that the translation Joseph Smith was making was genuine. He obtained permission to carry a copy of the several of several of the words from the plates together with their translation to some learned men. Martin Harris's account given to the Prophet Joseph Smith states that he took a copy to Professor Charles Anson, Anson of New York City, who certified that the characters were real, and correctly translated, but when Professor Anthon discovered the record, the record from which the characters were obtained was itself received by supernatural means, he retracted his statement by asking for his certificate back and tearing it to bits. Martin Harris reports that Anthon said, if I would bring the plates to him, he would translate them. I informed him that the, plate, the part of the plates were sealed and that I was forbidden to bring them. He replied, I cannot read a sealed book. I left him and went to Dr. Mitchell, who sanctioned 
what Professor Anthon had said respecting both the characters and the translation. The unlearned man to whom the book was delivered was, of course, Joseph Smith. Elder Orson Pratt once said, now in regard to Joseph Smith's qualifications for attain, uh, attainments in learning, they were very ordinary. He had received a little education in the common country schools in the vicinity, vicinity in which he had lived. He could read a little and could write, but it was in such an ordinary hand that he did not venture to act as his own scribe, but had to employ sometimes one and sometimes another to write as he translated. This unlearned man did not make the same reply that the learned man did, for when the book was delivered to the unlearned youth and he was requested to read it, he replied, I am not learned. I suppose he felt his weakness when the Lord told him to read this book, for he thought it was a great work. End quote from the manual. The Lord in 2 Nephi chapter 27, verses 21 through 23, tells Joseph Smith to translate the Book of Mormon, obtain the witnesses, but then he not, tells him, don't translate this or touch the sealed portion, but to return the book back at that time. The Lord then gives some of the rationale for why he will bring out the sealed portion when he brings out the sealed portion. One, to show that the Lord can do his own work. That was what was mentioned by President Nelson. Two, to show the world that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Once again, this is uh, this is crucial to understanding faith. Read the lectures on faith uh, from the uh, Prophet Joseph Smith, and this was also mentioned by President Nelson. Three, to show that the Lord is a God of miracles, but he does not do those miracles among the children of men, save it be according to their faith. Once again, that was gone over a lot at this conference. Now, if those three points, if they don't scream April 2021 conference, you were dead asleep. Okay? And I wrote about those uh, three things that I just mentioned in the breakdown of 2nd Nephi 27 well before the conference happened. So this wasn't written in hindsight. This was something that I had written when I was explaining 2nd Nephi 27 and what was happening here, and it just correlated perfectly, perfectly what, with what was said at conference. Those three things are what we're suffering from, and the Lord said he will bring those sealed portions back when we're suffering from those three things. Okay? So point of reference number three, the period of the times of the Gentiles ending. That's 1917 to 1967. This is described in Doctrine number 45. We've already gone over this. We learned that in that generation, the light will go global. The church will go global. People perceive not the light. Members begin turning their heart from the Lord because of the precepts of the men. They begin to do that. So we know that the priests of the men begin to infiltrate the church during this time as well. Now, uh, to, to confirm that, President Ezra Dove Benson taught, quote, the world worships the learning of men. They trust in the arm of flesh. Um, to them, men's reasoning is greater than God's revelations. The precepts of man have gone so far in the education system that in many cases a higher degree today in the so-called social sciences can be tantamount to a major investment in error. Very few men can build firmly enough on the rock of revelation to go through this kind of indoctrination and come out untainted. And I would say that even includes 70s and apostles. Okay? Unfortunately, uh, meaning uh, just because somebody is a bishop or stake president doesn't mean that doesn't mean that, that they can go through this indoctrination process uh, in the education system and come out untainted. President um, Ezra Benson is saying very few men are going to come out untainted. He continues, unfortunately, of those who succumb, some use their higher ed, uh, higher degree to get teaching positions even in our church educational system, CES, where they spread the falsehoods they have been taught. President Joseph Milling Smith was right when he said that false educational ideas would be one of the threats to the church from within. He, uh, President uh, Ezra Duff Benson continues in another quote, um, quote, now Satan is anxious to neutralize the inspired counsel of the prophet and hence keep the priesthood off balance and effective and inert in the fight for freedom. He does this through diverse means, including the use of perverse reasoning, sometimes from behind the pulpit, in our classrooms, in our council meetings, and in our church publications. We hear, read, or witness things that do not square with the truth. Now, do not let this serve as an excuse for your own wrongdoing. The Lord is letting the wheat and the tares mature before he fully purges the church. He is also testing you to see if you will be misled. The devil is trying to deceive the very elect. As members of the church, we have some close quarters to pass through. If we are to save our souls, as the church gets larger, 
Some men have increasing responsibility, and more and more duties must be delegated. We all have stewardships for which we must account to the Lord. Unfortunately, some men who do not honor their stewardships may have an adverse effect on many people. Often, the greater the man's responsibility, the more good or evil he can accomplish. The Lord usually gives a man a long enough rope and sufficient time to determine whether that man wants to pull himself into the presence of God or drop off somewhere below. There are some regrettable things being said and done by some people in the church today. As President Clark so well warned, the ravening wolves are among us from our own membership, and they, more than any others, are clothed in sheep's clothing because they wear the habiliments of the priesthood. We should be careful of them. And he gave that uh, quote, one of the quotes, in 1966. So once again, um, uh, that fits exactly into our macro timeline from 1917 to 1967. These things begin to be infil uh, begin to infiltrate the, the church. The precepts of men begin to uh, make their way in. So point of reference number four, the desolating sickness and all that it brings with it happen. Now we discussed all of this above when we dissected Doctrine and Covenants 45, but the big thing that you need to take away from this point of reference now when we're going through this is that the righteous begin rending the veil of unbelief and standing in holy places versus those who begin cursing God and dying spiritually. Okay, See my paper, Faith of the Brother Jared, for a, a breakdown of that. But you could also say um, there that that is a hinge point okay, or the hinge point of the church. The hinge point is between those who will decide to rend the veil of unbelief and stand in holy places versus those who are cursed, who will curse God and die. Okay, let's uh, keep going. Point of reference number five, Joseph Smith returns. Now, you'll get into this later in the paper when I go through 30 by 21, but for even more breakdown on that, see Joseph Smith return, Joseph Smith return continued, etc. And for an exceptionally good paper that will take you through all the points of reference that we've just gone over, and then some, <laughs> and then the return of Joseph Smith, see my paper, The Parable of the Nomen and Olive Trees, which, once again, is another one that just goes over these exact same things for one things as well. I don't go over the parable of an old man olive trees in this, and I don't go over Joseph Smith, Matthew 24. Um, the paper just got way too long, but uh, go check out uh, go check out those at your own leisure. We then get to point of reference number six. Joseph is again delivered the sealed plates by the Lord to translate the sealed portion. And the Lord explains why. Now we're at 2 Nephi 27, verses 24 and 25, with the Lord explaining, okay? One. And what do we learn from this? We learn, one, that this is now the second, at least the second time, that the Lord will have said this statement or something similar to this to the same individual. For the Lord says, and again, again, I'm going to talk to this person. And again, I'm going to say this. Second thing is, is that there are some major differences between the first time the Lord said this or said something similar to it and this time now described in 2 Nephi 27-25. Now, with that understanding, it allows us to more clearly understand when this takes place and why there are changes. This takes place after Joseph has obviously finished his work and has returned the plates. But it, it takes place directly before the Lord brings forth the sealed portion. That is where we are at with the points of reference. But what about the changes? Why did the Lord make those changes? Well, there are two major changes, and, and we should identify them because they're important. One, when Jesus was talking to Joseph Smith in the sacred grove, now that's point of reference of one above, the Lord said that men's hearts in that day, Joseph's day when he was in the grove, they were far from the Lord. Whereas in this, the second instance, a yet future event from us, as far as we know, it might have already happened, we don't know, it might have happened behind the scenes, the Lord says that his saints have removed their hearts from him. This once again harkens directly back to the parable of the nobleman and his olive trees. And Back to point of reference three above. But in point of reference three above, this was beginning to happen. By this point, point of reference six, the transformation is utterly complete. The second thing that we, we learned, the second difference is when Jesus was talking to Joseph in the sacred grove, he said the commandments were taught by men who had a form of godliness, but they denied the power thereof. Whereas in this instant, a yet future event from us, once again, as far as we know, 
the Lord says the saints will be taught to fear him, to fear the Lord, according to the precepts of men. Once again, this is what was taking place in point number three above, but now it's reached completion by the time it hits point six. In the next couple chapters of second uh, uh, of Nephi, from second Nephi 28 to the finishing of the wrapping up of Nephi's writing, Nephi warns the saints in that time period, which is our time period, of the state that they are in. A state that I believe we are currently in today. It's our time period. But for which President Nelson just confirmed that we're in. Second Nephi 28 and 29 are chock full of references dealing directly to the saints of today in this state of mind. They have removed their own hearts from the Lord, idolatry, and no longer fear the Lord because they are taught according to the precepts of men, priestcraft. Some might be saying right now, but what about secret combinations, Micah? You always talk about those. Well, you won't have to wait long. They are found in 2 Nephi 27, 27, the very next series of verses. But I won't be going into those in this, in this paper because it's already gotten too long. So let's jump to point of reference number seven. The marvelous work and a wonder, okay, as we continue in, in 2 Nephi chapter 27. 2 Nephi chapter 27, 26, therefore, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, yea, a marvelous work. And a wonder, for the wisdom of their wise and learned shall perish, and the understanding of their prudence shall be hid. If we go to the LDS student manual under 2 Nephi 27, verses 24 and 28, we read, A marvelous work and a wonder. The, right, the marvelous work and a wonder, spoken of by the Lord in 2 Nephi 27, 26, includes the Book of Mormon, the restoration of the priesthood, and the church, and the presence of Latter-day Prophets on the earth. But it is even more than these things. It is the restoration of all things, which would include Joseph Smith, including the establishment of Zion on the earth again, end quote. Now, quote from President Joseph Fielding Smith, when the lost tribes come, when they come, now this was, guys, this was given in 1970, so this is a president of the Church of Jesus Christ Larry saying, when the lost tribes come, meaning they haven't come, they haven't been found. Okay, so you think you're smarter than President Joseph Fielding Smith. Okay, the pro one, of the, one of our prophets. And I would say one of our good ones. Um, when the lost tribes come, it will be a most wonderful sight and marvelous thing when they do come to Zion, end quote. According to the Lord, the marvelous work in the water does not begin until this time. It, the, the marvelous work in the water. The Book of Mormon, the restoration of the priesthood, etc., were all precursors to this event. The Book of Mormon was written and designed to get us ready to build Zion and to get us ready for the sealed portion of the scriptures and to get us ready for the return of the ten tribes, etc. I have brought this up before, this concept, and I got a little bit of pushback from individuals. I then asked them if they were familiar with Brother Hiram Andrus, right? Because a lot of these people... Um, that listen to me are also familiar and fans of Brother Ham Andrus. This individual said, "Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with Brother Ham Andrus." And th this whole conversation took place during one of the Q and A's in my fireside. And then they said, "Well, yeah, I love Brother Ham Andrus, but he wouldn't agree with you on this." So below is a transcript from Brother Ham Andrus' lecture, "Christ's Coming to Zion, Jerusalem, and the World," and I include it here because um, there are a lot of people that um, like Brother Ham Andrus, and so um, I, I, I know that. His words, like my words, don't mean as much compared to the words of prophets and apostles and such. But uh, Brother Hyman Andrews does, for the most part, a very good job of making the words of the prophets and apostles speak for themselves. So, um, And so people like him. So let's read what he has to say about this. Therefore, I, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people and a wonder. Now that marvelous work and a wonder, according to the angel Moroni to Joseph Smith, is a work subsequent the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. Let me turn here to the Messenger and Advocate, where Oliver Cowdery writes about the visit of the angel Moroni and says this, Therefore says the Lord, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. The wisdom of their wise shall perish, the understanding of their prudence shall be hid. For according to this, for according to his covenant, which he made with his ancient saints, his people, the house of Israel, must come to the knowledge of the gospel and own their Messiah, whom they whom their fathers rejected, and with them the fullness of the Gentiles. We gathered in 
to the to rejoice in one fold under one shepherd. Now this great gathering of Israel hasn't yet taken place. And the marvelous work in a wonder isn't just the restoration of the gospel. It is a marvelous work, and I hardly agree with Elder LeGrand Richardson calling a book a marvelous work in a wonder. But now note what he says. This cannot be brought un about until first certain preparatory things have been accomplished. Meaning we can't have the marvelous work in a wonder until first certain preparatory things have been accomplished. So then the question would remain, have those first preparatory things been accomplished? You can't get the marvelous work in a wonder, which is not the Book of Mormon. It's the gathering of Israel. It's the building of Zion. It's the turning of things upside down with a new order of society and a government of law. It's the endowment of glory. It's the marvelous thing that finally ushers in the millennial period. That's the marvelous work and a wonder. That, uh, the Marvelous Work and Wonder puts it in this latter-day context. When you are finally going to redeem Israel and establish Zion, that is the Marvelous Work and Wonder. And the endowment of Zion with glory, the cloud by day, and the pillar of fire by night. End quote uh, from Brother Hiram Andrus. So, simply put, this is the Marvelous Work and Wonder that will be so miraculous that as Jeremiah put it, we will altogether stop talking about Moses. This involves the, the resurrection of Joseph Smith, obviously the beginning part of it, which is now once again proved by the Lord, identifying Joseph Smith as the person who will once again receive the sealed portion and translate it. And if Joseph is dead, he must be resurrected in order to do this work. Somebody asked me, why can't he translate the other side of the, of the veil? Um, uh, I, we, we, we need, if, if you're asking that question, we need to do some studying on what's the difference between a spirit body and a physical body. And, uh, you know, why did uh, Joseph Smith say one of the ways that you can identify a spirit um, is by asking to shake his hand and that, uh, and that you know, spirit does not affect or touch um, things the same way. So, you know, there's a reason why uh, Moroni was, had to be resurrected before he could hold and um, bring Joseph the plates via his own hands. And so, and, and then what would he write on? What would Joseph Smith write on? So he writing on spirit paper? Like, like uh, we, we need to have an understanding of, of – um, spiritual matter and physical matter, and Joseph Smith will need to have his physical body in resurrection in order to do this physical work for the translating of the plates and writing it down on physical paper that we on this earth can then read. Okay, so th that just can't happen. This point of reference ties directly into the parable, but somebody else said, how quickly can you translate it? That, I, that we don't know. It could be weeks, it could be months, it could be years. I, that I don't know. This point of reference ties directly into the parable of the nobleman and the olive trees, Joseph's boys, understanding Revelation, chapter 6 and 7, all of them. It's also important to note that the last line in verse 26, uh, in chapter uh, 2 Nephi 27, verse 26, almost assuredly then, by virtue of all this, it has reference entirely to members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This becomes crystal clear by the time you hit verse 35 in the same chapter. We're not going to get into that in the paper, but if you're interested in that, I'd recommend it. All right, go check it out. Now that we have done, now that we are done with Second Nephi 27, so now we've gone through that. We've gone through those points of reference, which I've just gone over and numbered them for you, and we have identified the marvelous work and a wonder. All right. Now that we've understand that, we will now be able to completely understand Three Nephi 21. We'll also be able to understand when, when, um, uh, when President Nelson said that uh, he had a better understanding of why the Lord or how the Lord will be able to do his own work in the last days. So now that we understand that, let's go to 30 by 21, and let's tie that into this same macro last day timeline. Quote, and when these things shall come to pass, that thy, that thy seed shall begin to know these things. It shall, come, it shall be a sign unto them that they may know that the work of the Father has already commenced unto the, unto the fulfilling of the covenant which he has made unto the people who are of the house of Israel. Okay, this is the Lamanites blossoming as a rose. That's that prophecy. Um, I, I, it's not that big of a prophecy. People keep asking for that paper. It's like literally a page and a half. I should just post it. Um, it's it's not that uh, that long, but that is referring to that prophecy. Now, it's interesting to note, if you understand what this prophecy, prophecy um, really is about, 
that those uh, who were to understand this, where he says, you will come to know these things, as a completion to the prophecy were actually not the Gentiles or Ephraim, but rather the literal and adopted ancestors of whom the Lord was speaking to. Thy seed shall know these things, right? So as soon as thy seed begins to know those things, them, right? M Manasseh. As soon as Manasseh begins to blossom as a rose and know these things. Not Ephraim. We've known this for a while. Uh, you know, as soon as they begin to truly understand that, then um, that'll this will the next things will happen. This is a point of reference, and so it's important to include it here before we continue. Which is interesting because maybe maybe waking up Manasseh and getting them to realize this is a huge a lot, a lot bigger indicator for the return of Joseph Smith. Maybe uh, we overlooked that. So um, getting more and more of these um, literal and adopted ancestors of, of, of this seed to wake up to this reality uh, is important. So, um, or was important rather. Um, continuing, and when that day shall come, it shall come to pass. Okay, let's stop there, right? Those are point of reference words. It's important to know it, note with the point of reference, right, when we understand this, that the word also was not used here. Okay. But rather, this sentence was used, meaning what comes next is not in addition to, but rather it is subsequent to, meaning it happens after. For us, in hindsight, that obviously has to be true because the Lamanites have blossomed as a rose long ago, uh, many years ago. But the other things that were listed here have not happened, right? So there can't be a conjunction here. It is, and when that day shall come, it shall come to pass. So when that happens, something else will happen um, after that, right? But if you were reading this back in Joseph Smith's time um, it, and you were trying to dissect this sentence and trying to create a more accurate macro essay timeline, you'd have to take that into consideration. It then continues that the king shall shut their mouths for that which had not been told them shall be see and that which they had not heard shall be considered. For in that day, for my sake, shall the father work a work which shall be a great and a marvelous work among them, and there shall be among them those who will not believe it, although a man shall declare it unto them. But behold, the life of my servant shall be in my hand. Therefore, they shall not hurt him, although he shall be marred because of them. Yet I will heal him, for I will show unto them that my wisdom is greater than the cunning of the devil. This is, once again, the marvelous work and a wonder. And once again, just like in 2 Nephi 27, we have confirmation that the resurrection and return of Joseph Smith is integral to that point of reference. If you are confused about how this is a reference to that, see my paper, Joseph Smith's return, or simply check out the footnote for Mard provided by the church, okay, in, provided in verse 10. And figuring out after that what the word heal means, well, that should be a pretty simple matter, right? Especially after we've learned that Mard equals the martyrdom of Joseph Smith. Let's go to Dr. Incomins 135. Let's read, they were innocent of any crime as they had often been proved before and were only confined in jail by the conspiracy of traitors and wicked men. And their innocent blood on the floor of Carthage jail is a broad seal affixed to Mormonism that cannot be rejected by any court on earth. And their innocent blood on the, oh man, Escution of the state of Illinois with the broken faith of the state as pledged by the governor is a witness to the truth of the everlasting gospel that all the world cannot impeach and their innocent blood on the banner of liberty and on the Magna Carta of the United States is an ambassador for the religion of Jesus Christ that will touch the hearts of honest men among all nations and their innocent blood with the innocent blood of all the martyrs under the altar that John saw will cry unto the Lord of hosts till he avenge that blood on the earth. Amen. Okay, and I've highlighted words here that we should pay attention to. Now let's turn to Revelation chapter 6. And uh, let's read here. And when he would opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar. So once again, you need to understand that this is after the fifth seal is opened. I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cry with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? 
and white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal. So this happens subsequent to that. And lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell on the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken in a mighty wind. Now this one's interesting. One. I, you know, I wish people would uh, pick up more on that one. That was a fun one. So the Lord says in Doctrine and Covenants 45 that um, that when the times of Gentiles are fulfilled, that will be your sign that the fig tree is sprouting forth its leaves. So you're going to know summer is nigh in hand. So the tree then during the summer, right? And during the summer would be during the life of that generation. They were to grow fruit trees, or uh, fruit uh, uh, figs, right? They were to grow figs. That was the job of the tree. But what and, and what, what does that mean? That means build the tower. That means redeem and build new Jerusalem. Okay. But what is an untimely fig? An untimely fig is a fig that never ripened. Right? It was too slow to ripen. It wouldn't get it done. So then what ends up happening is, is that and winter is coming. Right? You're out of time. So then what ends up happening is, is those untimely figs that are still hanging on the tree. Right? And the tree is the Lord's house, right? the Lord's kingdom. When the Lord first goes to his house and um, chastens his house, as with a whirlwind, i.e. with a mighty wind, um, uh, it'll be just like that event. Right? So anyway, they're all tied together. It's a dualism prophecy tied to that. So anyway, very interesting concept. I actually included the references to follow that chain if you were interested into it in, in it in my community tab. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondsman, every freeman hid themselves in the dens and the rocks, the mountains, right? So there's our purple, there's our fear. And said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth upon the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. The great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? Now, understanding these points of reference will lead one to an understanding that the opening of the fifth seal could not have occurred until after Joseph and Hiram's martyrdom. Once again, if you uh, don't understand that seals don't, the opening of the seals don't correlate with the thousand year periods, I'd recommend seeing um, Understanding Revelation intro, my paper on that. Um, or um, I read scripture, it's a YouTube channel. Uh, you can go and watch his video under, uh, explaining that concept as well. Continuing, therefore, it shall come to pass. Uh, this is now back in 3rd Nephi, which I failed to mention here. There, back, we're going back to 3rd Nephi, um, chapter um, 21, 20, and uh, verse 11. Therefore, it shall come to pass um, that whosoever will not believe in my words, who am Jesus Christ, which the Father shall cause him to bring forth unto the Gentiles, and shall give unto him power that he shall bring them forth unto the Gentiles. It shall be done, even as Moses said, they shall be cut off from among my people who are of the covenant. Okay, this is Joseph Smith bringing forth the sealed portion that we just went over in 2 Nephi 27. The warning that the Lord gives here for those who reject those words is echoed, almost word for word, by Moroni in Ether chapter 4, verses 8 through 11. Once again, the fact that these words are referring to the sealed portion is confirmed in Ether chapter 4. Okay, so that's that point of reference. And my people who are remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles, yea, in the midst of them as a lion among the beasts of the force, and as a young lion among the flocks of the sheep, who, if he go through, both treadeth down and teareth in pieces, and none can deliver. Now, you need to realize that this is what this is a direct tie-in to the point of reference that we've already gone into in Doctrine and Covenants chapter 87. And if you are reading Doctrine and Covenants 87 and you get to that point in time where it says that that uh, the remnant will become angry and shall vex the Gentiles, if you go down into the, the, the references, the footnotes below, it will actually take you directly to this verse. So it is one and the same event. Their hands shall be lifted up upon their adversaries and all their enemies shall be cut off. Yea, woe be unto the Gentiles except they repent for shall come to pass in that day. Right? In the day of Joseph's boys, in the, in the day of, of this redemption of Zion, saith the Father, 
I will cut off thy horses out of the midst of thee. I will destroy thy chariots. I will cut off thy cities of thy land. And I will throw down all thy strongholds. I will cut off witchcrafts out of thy land, and thou shalt have no more soothsayers. Thy graven images I will also cut off, and thy standing images out of the midst of thee. Thou shalt no more worship the works of thy hands. And I will pluck up thy groves out of the midst of thee, so will I destroy thy cities. And it shall come to pass that all lyings and deceivings and envies and strifes and griefs and whoredoms shall be done away. For it shall come to pass, saith the Father, that at that day, whosoever will not repent and come unto my beloved Son, that will I cut off from among my people, O house of Israel. And I will execute vengeance and fury upon them, even as upon the heathen, such as they have not heard. This is the whirlwind event uh, beginning to take place and going in full swing, right? This is Doctrine and Covenants 87.5, which I mentioned earlier up above. You can check those out in the, the references below as well. This is the parable of the nobleman and his olive trees. But more specifically, this is actually um, – this is the verses in the parable of the nobleman and his olive trees found in Doctrine and Covenants 101, verses 52 to 58, etc. This is Joseph's voice. This is the redemption of Zion. Continuing, but if they will repent and hearken unto my words and harden not their hearts, I will establish my church among them, and they shall come in. In unto the covenant and be numbered among this, the remnant of Jacob, unto whom I have given this land for their inheritance. And they shall assist my people, the remnant of Jacob, and also as many of the house of Israel as shall come, that they may build a city which shall be called the New Jerusalem. Once again, this is uh, after the redemption of Zion, for the Lord says those who repent and join them are in fact joining the remnants of Jacob who have already received their inheritances. And we do not receive any inheritances in the flesh until after the redemption of New Jerusalem. And uh, those that are doing this would be um, Ephraim and Manasseh, who would be getting their permanent inheritances at that time. For that is where and when our inheritances are delivered. It is also identified as the New Jerusalem. And the Lord identified the New Jerusalem as being in Jackson County, Missouri, and only in Jackson County, Missouri. So once again, this is not Salt Lake City. I'm sorry that I have to keep saying that, but um, I apparently have to keep saying that. Continuing in 3rd Nephi, and, and then shall they assist my people, that they may be gathered in who are scattered upon all the face of the land, in undo the new Jerusalem. This is the time period in which if you do not flee to new Jerusalem, if you do not allow yourself to be gathered into the program, you must take up the sword to fight against your neighbor. Continuing, and then shall the power of heaven come down among them, and I also will be in the midst. Okay, this is point number one in my macro last eight timeline, part one, right? These are the beginnings of the meetings at Adam on Iaman, and the Lord actually physically being there. Continuing in third Nephi, and then shall the work of the Father commence at that day, even when the gospel shall be preached among the remnant of this people. Verily I say unto you, at that day, Shall the work of the Father commence among all the dispersed of my people, yea, even the tribes which have been lost, which the Father hath led away out of Jerusalem. Okay, this is the lost ten tribes returning and the work commencing among them. The Lord here clearly says that the work will not commence among the lost ten tribes as a body until this point. But once again, confirming the separation between the gathering of scattered Israel and the return of the lost ten tribes as a body. After the ten tribes return, 12,000 of each of the tribes will be selected to form the 144,000, which will then go off and sweep the earth as like a flood to gather out the Lord's elect. This is the second time the Lord will set forth his hand to save his people. This is the day of the hunters of men. It is actually described in the completion of this chapter, 27. Um, continuing in 3 Nephi, Yea, the work shall commence among all that is first my people with the Father to prepare the way whereby they may come unto me and may call upon my upon the Father in my name. Yea, and then shall the work commence with the Father among all nations in preparing the way whereby his people may be gathered home to the land of their inheritance. Okay, well, only Ephraim and Manasseh are getting their in permanent inheritance at this time, but the Lord's promised at that day he's going to prepare the way that they, his people, may be gathered home and receive permanent inheritances in their lands of inheritance. That's old Jerusalem, right? So we get clear points of reference here that the new Jerusalem in America has to occur before the events at the Mount of Olives, period. And they shall go out from all nations 
and they shall not go out in haste, nor by flight, for I will go before them, saith the Father, and I will be the rearward. These points of references are gone over in the exact same order in Moses chapter 7. So let's read those real quick. And I've added my commentary here in blue to insert it to make it clear. I highlighted something in green, so you recognize that as well. So let's go through this and read it. I will just add my commentary as I go. I apologize if you aren't looking at this, then you won't be able to know in theory what's my commentary or not. But if you're looking at this, obviously blue is my commentary. And the day shall come that the earth shall rest. Now that's the great and dreadful day. But before that day, for what day? Before the great and dreadful day. The heavens shall be darkened, and a veil of darkness shall cover the earth, and the heavens shall shake, and also um, the earth, and great tribulations shall be among the children of men. But don't you worry, my people will I preserve. Okay, well, how is the Lord going to preserve us? And righteousness will I send down out of heaven. Well, that's how he's going to preserve us. And you know who that is that he's sending down out of heaven? It's Joseph Smith. And truth will I send forth out of the earth. That's the lost ten tribes of the body. To bear testimony of my only begotten, his resurrection from the dead, yea, and also the resurrection of all men. How would this happen? This would happen because we have the resurrection of Joseph Smith. We would also have all of those new scriptures coming forth via the sealed portion as well as the scripture that the ten tribes are bringing back. And righteousness and truth will I cause to sweep the earth as with a flood. That's the 144,000. To gather out mine elect from the four quarters of the earth unto a place which I shall prepare an holy city, Jackson County, Missouri, that my people may gird up their loins and be looking forth for the time of my coming. That's the great and dreadful day. For there in the holy city shall be my tabernacle. That's the Savior's physical body. And it shall be called Zion, a new Jerusalem. And the Lord said unto Enoch, Then shalt thou, meaning after these events, and all of thy city, this is the sign of the Son of Man, meet them there at the great and dreadful day. And we will receive them into our bosom, and they shall see us, and we will fall upon their necks, and they shall fall upon our necks, and we will kiss each other. And there shall be mine abode, and it shall be Zion, which shall come forth out of all the creations which I have made. For the space of a thousand years the earth shall rest. And it came to pass that Enoch saw the day of the coming of the Son of Man in the last days to dwell on the earth in righteousness for the space of a thousand years. But before that day, the great and dreadful day, Enoch saw great tribulations among the wicked, and he also saw the sea, that it was troubled, and men's hearts failing them looking forth with fear for the judgments of the Almighty God which shall come upon the wicked. In conclusion of this really long macro last day timeline breakdown and these points of reference, and I haven't even, you know, we haven't even gone over there. There's still Parable of the Nomen, Olive Tree, Matthew chapter 24. There's so many of these that we can clearly see what the macro last day timeline is. Now, but with an accurate understanding of the macro last day timelines and events, we will not, without an accurate understanding of the macro last day timelines and events, we will not be able to understand the times and seasons that we are in. We will not be able to know what is expected of us and why it is expected of us. If we do not understand what is expected of us, how will we ever be able to live up to those expectations? We need to learn the macro last day timeline, the points of references, so that we will be able to understand the talks being given at General Conference fully. So that we will not have ears dull of hearing and eyes dull of sight and a mind full of doubt and the veil of unbelief. We must learn these things and then acquire the faith as the brother of Jared that these things will all be fulfilled literally and plainly as the Lord prophesied they would. As we do this, I can promise you in the name of Jesus Christ that our minds will be expanded and our understanding enlarged and our faith perfected in Christ Jesus. Of this I testify and commit all of us to do and learn in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.